My name is Charles. I'm the founding director of the Child Psychiatry Access Project, PAP. And on behalf of uh, Nancy Byatt, who's the medical director of MacPap for Moms, I'd like to welcome you all to our quarterly MacPap for Moms webinar. Uh, it takes place on the fourth Wednesday of each quarter from 12 1. The topic is traumatic childbirth and its effect on mental health, navigating the uncertain road ahead. Uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping items. The session does get recorded, and um, it will be available on our MacPap for Moms website at www.macpapformoms.org, as will the uh, copy of the PowerPoint slides, and um, uh, uh, it will be available on the toolkits and resource page under PowerPoint pres presentations. I will be monitoring the uh, chat box, so if you have questions along the way, I may be able to I will answer, uh, ask our speaker, and if not, we'll save the questions for the end. Uh, following our presentation, you'll see a brief, you will receive a brief survey, and we appreciate your feedback to help us with the future, improve future presentations. Uh, <clears throat> to introduce our speaker today, Carol Brown is an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a social psychiatrist at Brigham Psychiatric Specialties. She did her medical degree at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Nashville, Tennessee, psychiatry residency training at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, and a women's mental health fellowship here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She specializes in treatment of psychiatric concerns across the reproductive lifespan the particular interest in mood and anxiety disorders. She is interested in racial disparities in mental health care and the intersection of anxiety disorders in women with pulmonary disease. So with that, um, I welcome uh, Dr. Brown to our uh, uh, conversation. Carol? Thank you so much for that introduction, John. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today I'll be talking about traumatic childbirth and the effects um, on mental health. No uh, disclosures to report. And the for uh, this talk is for us to go over uh, and describe a variable that was called traumatic birth, and by some factors for traumatic birth. And discuss some outcomes of traumatic birth and what lies to breastfeeding and subsequent pregnancy in particular. Also, talk a little bit about part of. Uh, yes? Yeah. Your voice is bringing up a little bit. Oh, that's better. I mean, yeah. Um, I'm going to try and move closer to the speaker. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about postpartum. Traumatic stress disorder and discuss some potential avenues for provider intervention. Um, I'd love to start with a quote from a healthcare provider um, who had a traumatic birth of her own. She had an emergency C section and subsequently had uh, postpartum hemorrhage. And about this, uh, her experience subsequently, and notes I left the hospital with my life and my daughter, so ostensibly I'm a success story. How my nurse wheeled me through the hospital doors and out into the warm sun of early spring, I knew but a shell of my former self with an uncertain road ahead. And I think it's important for us not to only hear these words, but we'll hear from uh, other women as well throughout the hour, because I think it helps to emphasize that this is a human experience. One of the things as professionals sometimes might be to detach uh, when discussing difficult topics, and this is one. So I'll start by introducing a case. And so this patient of mine I saw, um, she's a 35-year-old married Caucasian G2P1 woman, history of fear, and she was referred to me by her OB uh, reporting worsening anxiety during She had a difficult recovery three years prior, during which had complications related to uh, placenta accretion. She had extensive post um, as a result of uh, retained products of conception. After that first delivery, for the first six to eight weeks, she ended up in the hospital over and over for bleeding. 
and to undergo uh, multiple hysteroscopies. Uh, this is a pattern where she would repeatedly have to present to the ER to be taken seriously by staff, and she was often uh, experiencing this uh, effort to reassure her by OB staff when she would call in distress. She said, you know, it's like they thought I was stupid. I didn't know what was going on with my own body. So she only transferred care during her postpartum to another OB who she found to be a better fit, who was subsequently seeing her for the second pregnancy. Mixed feelings about this pregnancy. It was planned and desired, and she has been well managed with a combination of sertraline and individual therapy. Um, but ever since she found out she was pregnant, she has become increasingly more symptomatic. She notes significant fears about her delivery, and she is hoping for left a cesarean. At last OB appointment, concern was raised for a recurrent accreta, and the distress in the office led the doctor to refer her for an assessment. She's actively reporting right now flashbacks to her delivery, and they happen pretty frequently. She is able to identify triggers. They include seeing food trays in the hospital, smelling the hospital soap, um, and at home when she watches birth scenes on television. She has nightmares of her delivery, and these are worse on the nights prior to her having to come in for medical appointments, um, although this has gotten a bit better this pregnancy. She is noting poor sleep, irritability, tearfulness, and anxiety with some panic symptoms, although no discrete panic attacks. As such, she has only had one prior episode of depression in her early teens, involved on its own after several months without any treatment required. Her past psychiatric history, she's never hospitalized, no day programs, no intensive outpatient programs, has only taken the sertraline along with some lorazepam prior to medical procedures. She was therapy in 2012 after her mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and now she's actually seeing a therapist, or at the time I saw her, she was seeing a therapist there are four times a month. No so intent of cutting or earning, no aggression towards another. Does have a family history, sister with some depression and anxiety, a father with anxiety, a mother who has depression, including a postpartum episode. Healthy aside from the celiac disease. Um, anarchy at 12, regular 29-day cycles. Does note some premenstrual worsening of mood and irritability, which seems to be very um, has had perhaps a little improvement in mood symptoms in the past when she's taken oral contraceptives. The three um, she delivered vaginally are delivered through C-section actually at 36 weeks, and that was complicated by the placenta accreta, and she had the postpartum hemorrhage. Brief tried breastfeeding, but had poor milk supply. And right, now she's 30, 20 weeks once another C-section, and there is concern raised for the recurrent accreta. Take it all vitamin in addition to the sertraline and a social history. Um, born and raised in New England, well educated, has a master's degree in education, but is currently staying home with her daughter. Her husband is very supportive, they've been together for eight years, and she's got a good social support system locally with family nearby. No trauma prior to this, and no substance abuse history. So the questions to think about, um, and we'll discuss what if any did Hannah have for developing a, tra uh, a traumatic birth or for developing a psychiatric illness as a result of the traumatic delivery? How does her postpartum course fit in with what we know um, from the literature known outcomes? And then how um, should we conceptualize her current pregnancy and what should we think about um, with respect to treatment for her? And we'll look at the literature uh, involving childbirth and trauma, it falls into two categories. Women who view the childbirth experience as traumatic itself, and the women with prior trauma histories who become re-traumatized during childbirth, which then serves as a trigger. Um, the two are often intertwined, but for the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus on the first um, category only. By defining traumatic birth. Your studies use maternal birth trauma and uh, perineal trauma interchangeably, and so no conventional definition really existed until Carol Beck in 2004 decided to uh, coin it and uh, define it as an event occurring during the labor and delivery process that involves actual or threatened serious injury death to the mother or her infant. 
the birth of their experiences of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and horror. And she was later expanded upon to include events during which the mother uh, perceives that she's being stripped of her dignity. If we look worldwide at the prevalence of traumatic births, um, overall, studies which suggest um, maybe average rates of 25 to 35 percent of women are reporting that their birth experience is traumatic. And so this actually may be quite more uh, common than we would initially suspect on the surface. Um, these sort of um, retrospective studies, the methods uh, for collecting data are variable. A lot of these patient reported scales or clinician reports. Um, some studies that have higher rates, you'll notice I ran, there's a study 54.5%, Australia, some 45.5%. Uh, um, some studies have um, an online component, so there's some suspicion that may self report a screen um, might just feel more comfortable being honest and reporting some of these symptoms, so maybe even the other surveys are under, under reporting. But never it seems like this might, might be a more common. When we think what contributes to birth trauma, there are three things that um, come into play. The patient perception of their birth experience, obstetrical risk factors, and patient risk factors. Perception, and if our birth would be defined as traumatic, like the patient has to perceive it as traumatic. So there's a, a essential component for uh, the definition of a traumatic birth. Her. Um, there are many things that can contribute to the birth being perceived as traumatic. Uh, lack of information from medical providers, perceived lack of empathy from medical providers, um, limited or no support from partners, not consulted about medical interventions or what patients may consider inadequate consent, and inadequate pain control. Oftentimes, there can be a mismatch between expectations and actuality of birth, and that can also contribute contribute to the perception of birth as traumatic. And so unless what the provider might feel like um, in terms of qualifications or how a patient they perceive has experienced it, and it really might be more based on what the patient herself is um, experiencing or how they're perceiving what they hope for their pregnancy and delivery and what has actually happened. When we look at the obstetrical risk factors, um, the bolded are the ones that have come across more uh, repeatedly throughout the literature. So we know that having a cesarean um, does increase your risk for having a traumatic birth substantially, and that risk increases further if it's an emergent C-section as opposed to a planned. Um, and assisted deliveries is another significant risk factor. Um, having to have labor-induced, having a hemorrhage, having pelvic floor trauma, or an episiotomy also included. On the right-hand side are more complications related to the newborn. And so patients that have uh, babies that have had medical complications or spend time in the NICU. Again, this is where perception is key because even if a provider does not feel that the medical complication is significant, if the patient feels that it's significant, then they can consider that a risk factor. Fetal device, preterm delivery, delivery fetal position, macrosomia, and uh, curiously, in delivery in the hospital setting has also been consistently reported as well as increasing the risk. When we think about some of the patient risk factors, uh, for birth, age younger than 18, uh, parity, belong to a lower socioeconomic status, uh, unmarried, ethnic or racial minority, have a prior trauma history, uh, the fault of traumas are going to be more likely to raise um, risk for a traumatic birth as opposed to non assault of trauma, and the more recent the trauma, the higher the risk as well. Prior psychiatric history, especially if that history includes PTSD, personality disorders, or any hints of uh, neuroticism. Having good coping skills, um, heavy substance use, or have insufficient prenatal care all increase the risk. When we look at Hannah's case, we can see many things that would increase her risk for having a traumatic birth. She was set up. Um, this was her first delivery. She had an extensive hemorrhage. She has a hysteroscopy matter. Um, she, there's a question that she's not seriously that her, uh, her concerns were invalid by staff. Um, she has a history of prior 
So now we're going to think a little bit about what are some of the common outcomes following traumatic birth. We'll talk about breastfeeding, um, impact on the relationships and intimacy, impact on subsequent pregnancies, and finally, impact on health, uh, mental health and well-being. Starting with breastfeeding, um, traumatic births are associated with delayed lactogenesis. Um, Dewey and his colleagues propose a couple of different methods by um, which milk synthesis results, and we'll see a little bit of that on the next slide. Um, and we know women just have lower rates of successful breastfeeding um, over with long duration of labor and emergency section being powerful predictors for delayed lactogenesis. And so here um, on this slide, um, Chesum, so doing was that a difficult labor leads to impaired oxytocin switching, which leads to poor milk letdown, which leads to uh, decreased milk synthesis. Also the proposal that uh, difficult labor leads to a weak neonate that has a poor suckle, so there's input primary milk removal, and again, ultimately leading to decreased milk synthesis. When what out their experience of breathing and how emotionally that is birth, people report that it feels like yet another trigger. And so a woman notes, when I fed my baby, it felt like it was one more invasion upon my body, and I could handle that after the labor I had suffered. The literature shows that women will report having flashbacks to their delivery, that they'll dissociate And a lot of times I can use some women to stop breastfeeding altogether. It's um, important because sometimes that effort to assist while well meaning um, can actually be re traumatizing for patients. Okay. On the other hand, okay. please uh, yes. stay close to the microphone. You do break up once in a while. Thank you. Sorry about that. First, then. Breast becomes a correct experience, and so I think that's important to keep in mind as well. So it notes that breastfeeding was a timeout from the pain in my head. It was a current reality of to cling on to some real life, whereas all the trauma that continued to live on my head belonged to the past, even though I couldn't keep it there. And so these patients use terms like soothing freely in their narratives, and the themes are more of that of regaining control and mastery over the body. When it's intimacy, women will often describe feeling anxious, feel pain, feeling pain or incontinence um, when it comes time to resume intimacy. Themes frequently focus on the body being unpredictable and the sexual identity as a woman. And so we've been noting it's almost like trying to do it for the first time. And I'm often in tears because I'm so scared. He's patient, but he does go, maybe tonight we can try. And I'm like, sure. I was so anxious about it. I made myself really sick. Six weeks without sex, that's the magic number you hear. But it's still 18 months down the track, and it's very rare that we can achieve intercourse. It's certainly impacted our relationship because you know he thought things would be back to normal by now. This can really be an important point of uh, education for patients and their families and partners um, because certain impact that patients may not feel comfortable discussing or bringing up. With subsequent pregnancies, it's well reported that women have a fear, may have a fear of subsequent pregnancies. Um, Tana has a small study um, looking at a sample of women who had postpartum hemorrhage or preeclampsia. 85% of women in that cohort reported fear of recurrent pregnancy. Women also noted a decreased shared uh, family size. Um, we know that women who are first-time moms are more likely to avoid subsequent pregnancies, and what that might look like clinically is request sterilization or even terminations of subsequent pregnancies. Women do go on to become pregnant, and we know that they're more likely to request uh, elective C-sections, and they're more likely to have longer pregnancy intervals. This slide is uh, by Gottfeld and group in Sweden, they laid this out nicely. They looked at women younger than 35, uh, followed initially two months after their birth, and followed them out for over a decade. And looked at, and they asked the women what their experience was like, uh, allowed them to rank it on a scale of very negative to very positive, like rating here. 
And we that women that um, the more negative their birth experience was, the less likely they were to have subsequent birth. And for those that did go on to have longer intervals in pregnancy. When we create health, health um, I think people in economy of depression, and we know that 20 to 30 percent of women do report significant depressive symptoms or anxiety after traumatic birth. And a lot of times, that can re they can report in the office fears of being an inadequate mother, fears of adequately uh, being able to manage a medical emergency involving the infant. Will look like they'll report compulsive checking the infant. How many times a night do you get up to watch the baby? Put your over the face to make sure baby's breathing, and they'll say, "Oh, every half hour, every hour." Um, we certainly know that eating disorders and substance use disorders are often triggered in the postpartum period if women have suffered traumatic births as well. Um, and unfortunately, the literature looking at depression and anxiety alone, depressive disorders and anxiety disorders is limited. Um, and we have a lack of controlling for a lot of premortal psychopathology and there are inconsistent measures to determine some of the psychopathology used. In the qualitative literature, there are a lot of narrative themes that still emerge that are common experiences that women will report after traumatic birth. Um, we'll talk about being stripped of protective measures, where they feel they're vulnerable, they're exposed and powerless, and they're dismissed or ignored when they reach out for help. Women were feeling like this wound of um, traumatic birth is invisible. They like they can't disclose because the bad motherhood is, is how to suffer without complaining, especially if their baby is healthy. Um, and they also report sort of insidious repercussions, usually related to attachment. So in the postpartum, they report having these great thoughts and hopes for motherhood that are then shattered, um, and feel they can't bond in grieving the loss of those dreams. The best of the mental illness is postpartum, postpartum post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Um, and so there is decent literature there. Most of it is qualitative. Um, there are epidemiological studies um, that look at retrospective data. Some of them are able to better control for premorbid psychopathology. And there are a lot that start with prevalence rates. And so we look at the population, the prevalence of PTSD is 4 to 8 percent. And when we look at postpartum PTSD, the rate seems to be, especially when studies are able to control for um, premorbid pathology, looks to be about 2 to 7 percent. And it's that some studies have much higher rates, and those rates usually because patients are reporting symptoms either fully or without that human interface. And so maybe they're reporting a comfort rate um, a little bit higher than what we would initially suspect. If we have criteria for PTSD, um, we'll remember that exposure to an actual threat or threat of death, serious injury, or sexual violence, either through direct experience, witness the event in person, or learning that the event occurred, um, is required um, to have PTSD. Um, we won't talk about it today, but it's important to note for witness the event in person, oftentimes significant others or family members that are in the room will report symptoms too um, after watching their loved one go through um, a traumatic birth. So it's very important sometimes if able to be able to check in with other family members and loved ones to make sure that they're doing okay as well. Healthcare providers can also have secondary um, PTSD if they're witnessing these events as well. So self-care with staff, especially younger staff that may not be as used to experiencing or witnessing um, difficult labor and deliveries, they might become symptomatic as well. Um, here is the presence of intrusion symptoms, avoidance symptoms, and then negative alterations in uh, cognition or mood, and arousal symptoms. And we'll go through these uh, one by one. You have symptoms lasting for at least a month after the trauma, and it must be significant enough to cause distress or impairment in functioning. Who are postpartum, intrusion symptoms can look like flashbacks to the delivery, free thoughts out of the blue of how ill or near death they or their infant was, um, may report dissociating um, while breastfeeding during intercourse or simply during routine activities throughout the day. 
may look like for uh, in postpartum. They may delay naming the infant. They may reluctant to see infant, may send them off to the nursery and not go down to the NICU. They may resist being discharged. They avoid talking about their pregnancy delivery. They won't read about it. They avoid sex. And they miss postpartum appointment to using well baby visits. And talked about previously, they avoid subsequent pregnancies. The mood symptoms in men can often look like impaired mother interactions. And some women will report blaming the infant for the birth experience. And there's great shame attached to women being comfortable enough to even disclose these type of symptoms. Um, they may report blaming the infant for their birth experience. And they may report uh, feeling numbing and difficulty attaching. Um, this study by Jeff Cote and his colleagues uh, looked at men who had preterm deliveries compared to control. 30% of the mothers of preterm infants reported feeling love for their infant within 24 hours, compared to 66% of mothers in the control group. And that were only jumped up to 50% within two months, um, compared to over 90% of the control. Um, so that's a substantial difference. In the office, this may look like patients sort of reporting a desire to make sense of. And so I hear that phrase often, I just want to make sense of it. I don't understand. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Multiple symptoms may look like um, some things that you would more commonly expect: sweating, trembling, uh, sleep disturbances, exaggerated startle response, irritable, and angry outbursts. Can be very common, and often it can be directed at healthcare providers. So it's important to understand where that may be coming from, um, and recognize it as a sign or symptom of potential pathology. If you look at the predictors of developing postpartum PTSD, they're very similar to the risk factors for having a traumatic birth. Um, so there's consistency in the literature there. Having C-section, having instrument-assisted deliveries, having other physical risk factors, paremesis, preeclampsia, preterm contractions, manual removal of the placenta, any pain that reports dissociation during the delivery had shorter pregnancy interval, um, had negative past deliveries. And for patients that feel an external locus or have external locus of control, meaning that they tend to feel less self-empowered, um, all be at increased risk. So back to our case, we go back to Anna. She comes back for follow-up. Um, a few weeks later, we're currently placenta that has been confirmed, and so she is very to report that she'll have a C-section. Um, she notes that her mood is stable, but she's having involved in some hyperarousal symptoms. She, her husband is supportive, but she struggles to share with him because he was traumatized too. She was about delivering at the hospital and says, you know, it just might be much. I'm not sure if I can do it. And so he reaches out and asks if anything can be done for her in preparation for her delivery over the coming months. To delivery, there are things that uh, certainly can be done to help minimize the risk of having a recurrent traumatic birth um, or having patients have exacerbations of their symptoms. Medically, it is worth considering a left of cesarean in certain cases, not advocating that every patient that has had a traumatic birth immediately requires uh, a C-section, but it's worth considering when So it can be a mismatch between the patient's preferred method of delivery and the actual delivery route, and that can increase the risk of PTS symptoms. So when possible, it might, might be something to consider. It to be frank conversations about potential complications and the need for emergent procedures. Again, if patient perception is key, having a mismatch between what the patient envisions and thinks their labor and delivery might look like um, with the realities it can set them for um, symptoms of the road. It's really important to be front and honest. And times, out of fear of worrying patients unnecessarily, we may hold back. Um, but having open, honest conversation is very essential here. To do so, obtaining a patient narrative of their prior birth experience and asking for specific fears can be really important. And use that narrative in terms and uh, in turn create a collaborative uh, treatment plan. 
that isn't on the slide is just, just I think general awareness during exams about the language chosen can be really helpful as well. Um, things like open your legs or this won't hurt as much or this will only hurt a little can be really triggering for patients. Um, and so when able, being a little more selective or mindful of the words chosen can sometimes have a big impact, although a lot easier said than, than done. So able to do a treatment plan ahead of time with a patient, um, people to know what to put in it. If able to clearly identify pain control measures ahead of time, that can be incredibly empowering for patients. Um, personally, for patients, if they've had a very difficult delivery and they're delivering at our hospital, I will try and have them consult with anesthesia ahead of time. And so there are no questions going in. They know very clearly during my hospitalization what I'm going to receive and upon discharge here what my options are. If you're delivering at a hospital or a facility for the first time, being able to tour the facility at a time is very empowering as well, especially if they can have a supportive family member or friend along. Um, I find support, uh, their support team ahead of time very important. A lot of patients will report feeling denied somewhat by normal things that necessarily think about. Um, the staff turnover change sometimes means that patients are seeing multiple providers in a short period of time, and if they have that in their background, that can be able and easier set on. Keeping staff consistent um, can be helpful. Avoid minimizing basic procedures whenever possible, and that includes vaginal deliveries. So a patient who's had a very difficult traumatic birth may not be the patient that training case for a med student and the resident and an attending to come by and do um, a cervical check. Um, so being mindful of, of, uh, of that can be really important. A little bit that breastfeeding can sometimes be um, a trigger and sometimes be supportive. Clarifying the role of lactation consultants up front is very important. And have identified options for medications for anxiety during delay and for sleep as well in the postpartum. So the her treatment plan looks like the following. So we were able to arrange for her to tour the postpartum floor. She was admitted to a different floor than she had for her first delivery. We were able to complete the anesthesiology consult ahead of time. Um, we talked about the epidural during her appointments. It was agreed upon that she would get Ativan or lorazepam PRN um, prior to the epidural being placed. Um, we talked about decorating her room. Uh, from room ahead transfer. The husband was going to remove the soap, which you remember was serving as a trigger for her, um, and she requested to bring special blankets and photos from home. All very small things, but made a big difference for her. Um, she was able to wear her own gown postpartum. We identified that she'd have trepidum for sleep and lazapam if that wasn't effective. She did not want any visits from the lactation consultant team. And arranged for her to have Skype sessions with her individual therapist prior to discharge. Again, by psychiatry prior to her discharge. And she noted that, um, and husband both asked, that staff be waited for the patient, uh, wait for her to express desire to visit the nursery. She didn't want to feel pressure and then feel guilt if she didn't feel up for it. So she wanted to be the one to initiate that conversation. She also noted, and husband noted, that there were moments where he could identify with the first story that she was not at her baseline, that something was wrong, but no one asked him directly. So they both requested that he be interviewed alongside her during the weekend. After delivery, it's important to assess um, for postpartum PTSD. We start by asking the simple question, how did your birth experience letting the patient go from her? Um, there are ways to symptoms as well. I think traditionally we do a good job of screening for depression, screening for anxiety, um, but we can sometimes misdiagnose women with postpartum depression or avoid checking for PTSD in particular. Um, but you do this with some simple questions tailored towards the birth experience. Um, do you avoid thinking about your birth? Do you avoid people or buildings that remind you of the birth? Have you had negative dreams about your birth? Um, do you kind of think about it without really wanting to talk about it? Difficulties falling asleep. Do you remember negative or experience negative body 
Please list the sensations when you remember your birth. All these can be simple questions to add in to help uh, point that, that post PTSD might be at play. Um, and then if a patient has suffered a traumatic birth, trying to figure out what to do in the postpartum can be really complicated. Um, and there's this body literature about how to actually help, help these patients. Um, you'll hear sometimes patients um, and providers will advocate for psychological uh, debriefing. Um, these focus on attentive listening, validation, filling in gaps of patient narratives. Um, patients actually really love. So the literature will say a very high rate of patient satisfaction with an ability to sort of share their story, share their narrative. Um, however, there's very limited evidence showing that this is effective in reducing rates of actual postpartum illness. Um, and there are several drawbacks as well. So it requires trained individuals. There's no consistent treatment guidelines regarding when to begin. Do we include partners? How many sessions? For some reason, it's not the standard of care here in the U.S. or the U.K., but it's used a lot in Australia. Um, sometimes you'll run across a birthing center or a hospital that does use this method. Um, and again, just knowing that even though patients find it validating and helpful, it doesn't necessarily translate to a reduction of actual symptom, um, symptom burden down the road is important. Um, can certainly be a helpful thing to offer a patient. And there are some selective techniques that are helpful. Um, and some helpful if you're in an area where there's limited access to therapists or psychiatrists. Um, sometimes have patients recount birth story or write out their birth narrative can be really powerful. Um, psychoeducation and bolstering their partner support can be helpful. Um, some persons are able to do simple mindfulness techniques, um, provide the patient a list of apps that will help the patient do progressive muscle relaxation or space uh, place imagery. Simple um, things like that can really make a big difference as well. In medications, um, what we can offer patients is very similar to what we offer patients um, with PT minus postpartum experience. Um, so traditionally, SSRI is the first in medication choice. We often use sedating tricyclics or rimercazepine and types atypical antipsychotics. You'll see some providers that, that will use prescin or clonidine or propranol, and the antihypertensives can really sometimes reduce uh, and some of the hyperarousal symptoms as well. Um, there's mixed literature involving uh, benzos, and so benzos are very commonly used, um, especially in the hospital setting. Some literature would suggest it may uh, improve, increase the risk of dosiation, um, especially in the immediate postpartum following a trauma. So there's some, um, some ongoing benzo use. Um, Transitum trader also subject to debate. Down the pipeline, these are things that are certainly in the very, very, very early stages of looking at, um, but don't have our clinical um, stamp of approval quite yet. I wanted to switch gears a little bit because we've talked a lot about sort of the next of something quite happening to a patient. We haven't talked about um, some what can emerge that's positive. And so um, we should think about post-traumatic growth. And there is um, a nice literature looking at PT. Um, and it's not coping, it's not resilience, although there's some of that in the concept. Um, but it really is described as incremental psychological change and improvement and applies to several different domains. Um, you can have PTG from car accidents or from other trauma or from chronic medical illnesses. For patients who have traumatic growth or traumatic uh, birth, they report growth um, mostly in the domain of having a greater appreciation for life, uh, as well as improved relationships and greater sense of personal strength. When we about what would make a patient more likely to experience post-traumatic growth, just uh, that have uh, coping strategies that seek out guidance and support, as well as active problem-solving strategies, that's a help. Patients that have the avoidant coping strategy is seeking alternative rewards. And that's actually adaptive, even though it's avoidance. That's like patients saying that, you know, I'm 
going to get involved in new activities. I'm going to make new friends. I'm going to join a mom's group. I'm going to become an advocate. Um, that can also be a powerful predictor of PTG. So younger in age and patients that have cesarean sections um, likely to have uh, PTG. And then patients that have that internal sense of control, um, which makes sense. Patients that are able to incorporate and see and think, um, how can I harm myself to act and improve and take charge and benefit more? And PTG come out of a traumatic birth experience. Um, the list just sort of suggests that patients would either have one experience, either go down the road of post-traumatic stress and uh, PTSD, or they could have post-traumatic growth. And the goal then was to find a point of intervention which would allow them to choose one path in the road as opposed to the other. But what we now know is that patients can experience symptoms of PTSD and PTG simultaneously. That's important to keep in mind as well. Good with time still for questions. Um, so we'll end the summer just reminding that as many as one in three women can experience their childbirth as traumatic and the medical factors, patient perception of their care, and then patient risk factors are all going to contribute to traumatic birth. Um, and lactogenesis and low rates of breastfeeding, uh, which is subsequent pregnancies and uh, impact on intimacy can also result from traumatic birth. And the psychological consequences include depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Um, and that post-traumatic growth has been described as a mode of development following a traumatic delivery. And that's that time for questions. Yes, Kara. Um, if uh, folks would, uh, in the right-hand screen, you should see a place where you can uh, type in questions. anyone who has a question and uh, uh if you uh, when you sign off you'll uh will you'll be sent a uh, survey and we appreciate again you filling that out and a reminder that there will be a recording of the uh webinar on our website along with the uh, powerpoint any questions at this point Um, as, as birth doula, knowing the risk factors are may help me help support in the pregnancy period. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, a, a, a good group of listening who are, help, are helping in the postpartum period. That's the information here. Sounds like it would be very Absolutely. Any experiences that they uh, want to uh, watch Brown about? Come to mind that had a problem. Okay. Um, won't, uh, hope we won't hold everybody up if there are no further questions. I thank you all for joining the, the webinar today. And uh, please remember that if you ever have any questions around this issue or any other um, issue uh, uh, during the, the pregnancy, the postpartum period, you can always call McPat for moms. Thank you.